I am going to be working on the five by seven panel. I'm using the gesso board like we discussed. And so I'm just going to cut that bad boy open and set it aside. And then here's the image. Um, and I printed out and I talked about how we would this be omitting the people. This was from Photos for Artists. It's a free um, artist um, website that you can use pictures and whatnot. So um, that's where I got this today. And then I'm going to uh, work with the transparency and I'm going to work with a piece of paper um, just so that I can do some little drawings to get some thumbnail sketches out for it. So I think I'm going to cut the bottom of this paper off real fast so I can slide it down further. Actually, I'll just put my thumbnails on this. I don't want the glare of that light to step in. Okay, so hopefully you can see that. I got the palette here. I'm not going to use the paint just yet though. But in talking about uh, breakdowns for the image and what you're choosing to keep and not keep, we um, can look at compositions. And with landscapes, which you know I said we would try and keep this focused on landscapes so that we could um, break it down each time. Um, I always want to identify the horizon line, and the horizon line for me is uh, typically where uh, heaven and earth meet, so it's where the ground meets the sky, and that can exclude any of this background stuff. So for me, the horizon line would be somewhere right here, okay? And then um, I can pick any other large uh, defining features of the composition. So for me, for sure, I see this, which was a good dividing line and I see it on this side okay but I also see an additional line here where the green meets that kind of deadened grass and you could put that or not put that but I'm just going to acknowledge that it's there I also see a little drop here that is some um, different discolored grass in the background and then I see something like this okay and then I could additionally go in and just put some of this dark even though it um, doesn't have to be that literal, but I can go in and just divide that I see it, and I can even do something like that if I want. Okay, now if I'm leaving out the people, um, that's essentially all the shapes that um, I see in the picture, anything that's kind of overwhelming um, without going into detail. So I want to look at that as just a simple uh, composition. So I'm going to slide a regular piece of paper in between here and just look at it as a composition standpoint. So I can see a little bit clearly the lines that are here um, and the shapings that are going on and just how I've simplified it just by doing that. And you don't need a transparency and a um, dry erase marker to do that, but it just kind of simplifies the lines. And had I not broken it down that way, like if I'd left off some of the other distinguishing colors, I could even have less lines. So just keeping in mind that breakdown, um, I want to now go into um, some thumbnails where I can just identify some values. And I'll even keep it simple to, um, you know, maybe a one, two, three, four value. So I'm going to take the transparency away temporarily. And I'm going to try and repeat what I did here with the um, transparency. So I'll create a box that's roughly the uh, landscape orientation that I wanted. And I'm just using a regular pencil here. And then I'll identify where that horizon line came. And for me, you know, it could generally be a third. It's a little bit uh, like a little bit greater than a third, but I can keep it general and just say, okay, well, let me try and keep it at a third. And there's a little bit lower. All right, so there's my horizon line. Then I can try and break down the other shape. So I see this slight angled shape coming through for the top of the um, creek. And I'm just going to tilt that over and have it going off the edge. And I'm noticing that the edges come here and here on the bottom. So when I'm wanting to know, you know, how should I, let me erase that stray mark. If I'm wanting to know where I want that to fall as far as coming off the page, I can say, oh, okay, well, it needs to come about right here. So that way, when I start the creek here, I can drag it down and come down and around. And then I've got kind of this open mouth for the water itself, okay? Then I'm gonna go above the horizon line and I'm just gonna put this general shape for the um, 
the, the mountains or rock structures that are behind it. And so I'm looking at where that tree falls and I'm also looking at where maybe the end of this rock structure falls. And so again, I could be dealing with a third. I'm gonna measure it by letting my um, in tip of my pencil hit right here where um, I feel like the rock structure ends and I'm gonna say, okay, that's one measurement, right? And then there's two and there's three. So yes, it is a third. So now I'm gonna create third here and I'll say, okay, that rock structure should end, that's really a third, somewhere up right here. And then I know if I come in from the side and just go diminish down, then I've got essentially where I want that structure to end. And this other one overlaps and picks up and goes up and off. So just that quick, we've got at least the, the bigger pieces of the, um, picture in here. I'm going to kind of make some adjustments where I didn't keep that straight. And then I can start to acknowledge values. So I see this really dark defining line. So I'm just going to squiggle in some darkness so that I can have that really uh, definite feature in there. And then I'm noticing that the lower part of this has some dark values, so I can put that in there. It gets lighter as it goes up, which is fine. And then I see this dark value, which, you know, even though it's an irregular shape, I'm just going to go over for now. And then I will put the, the tree, like we acknowledged, in there and just have that dark setting. And I'm going to put it a little bit lower here so that I have that. Um, now, whether or not I choose to put the people or whether I choose to put these um, structures that they're sitting on, I'm just going to put those in there just so I can have a little bit of balance. I feel like they help to create a diagonal to this, you know, point. So the sky creates an angle that puts me on the tree and then the tree kind of carries me here and then this carries me off and then the, the value carries me off. And the fact that the people are there, um, you know, it feels like everything's kind of leading me down and around here. Um, but essentially I have a value in place. I can say that whether this water is a little bit darker, I can kind of lightly sketch in something here. And then maybe I see a little acknowledgement of a lighter value here. Okay, and then if I had to start calling these things as far as value names, I might say that this water is a three. And then maybe these items are fours. And then something lighter like, you know, this is a two. Um, maybe this brown, if I was going to divide this structure, and I'm seeing that the deadened grass goes right to the top of this sitting structure, so I could just go straight over like that, and maybe I'll call this deadened grass a two. Maybe I'll call the beginning of this a two, and then I'll leave something like the bright green to be a one, and maybe I'll leave the clouds to be a one and a one. So just that quickly, I've just kind of mapped out both shape and value. We talk about, you know, S, V, and C, and we're going shape, value, and color. Now, I can acknowledge um, some of the measurements that need to take place or if things need to be, you know, scrutinized a little bit more, especially if it was um, something more representational or a person or uh, an animal that had like a personality. You'd want probably every little millimeter to be on point so that it captured it. But for the sake of this and just capturing the local color, the shape, and the value, um, to me, that's got a good enough value study to catch me in and get me started. Um, so now I'm going to translate it over to the panel. So I'm taking my gesso board and I'm going to turn it horizontally so that I can keep my palette in view, but also I'm going to keep my paper towel so that I can, um, you know, wipe off the brush periodically. And then I'm going to keep my value study and my painting over here to the side. So hopefully you have that all set up. I've got my oil just out of reach, or my thinner just out of reach here. And I'm gonna go in with my small brush. Now I'd said it earlier, but I'm gonna be using um, my number two silver Grand Prix brush, and I'm gonna be using my number six uh, silver Grand Prix brush. Um, and this is just like the six and the two, the small rectangle that you have in class, and then the longer brush. Um, and I always draw with my smaller brush because it's smaller, it won't tear up, and I can kind of get some line making in there. And generally, I will draw with ochre, especially if it's the dominant color in the, um, in the setting. So I'm dipping my brush in thinner, 
and then I'm tapping it on the paper towel just so that it's moist but it's not saturated. And I'm coming in, these colors are titanium white, uh, cad yellow light, yellow ochre, alizarin crimson, ultramarine, and I've got a Payne's gray here. You may, I could have eliminated the uh, ochre and the Payne's gray and just done with even more minimal, um, but it just required more mixing and I wanted to stay focused on the composition. So for the purpose of the drawing, I'm gonna pull a little bit of the ochre out. And again, I'm using the thinner. Every time I'm tapping a little bit of the thinner on the paper towel, but then I'm just creating this soupy mixture so I can get a thin residue of color that I can put onto the panel itself. I'm reminding myself where I told the line was. I said that it was um, almost a third, right? It was a little bit uh, lower than a third. So if I need to be this tedious with it, I can actually mark off thirds first, just so I can measure and see, am I getting it at a third? So I'm gonna measure this and say there's one third, there's two thirds and there's three thirds. So yeah, that's pretty good. And then I know that it's a little bit lower than that third. So what I may choose to do is just drop the line down slightly. And then I'm gonna go just all the way across with my yellow because I read this as being a little bit lower than a third. So I just went a little bit lower than a third and I created my horizon line. Just one thin soupy mark. Then I'm going to go to my next dominant line that I see, which is um, where this uh, creek comes in. And again, I can take a measurement to determine maybe the top of the creek bed is a third. I'm going to measure it to see. No, it's not. It's about, um, let's say, one, two, and a half. So if I were to come down um, and guesstimate, it should end up being a um, one and a half additional length if I'm coming in. I do know where the corner is because I've got a little bit more placement on the um, picture. I noticed here where the edge is, and I know for a fact that it was lower than the third. So I've already got my third marked here. I'm just gonna go a little bit lower and put the edge of that creek. And that's my guess for that. And then I'm noticing where it falls here, and I can measure to see how far that is. I'm gonna say, let's go with one two, three, three and a half, right? So I'm gonna put a guess down at where I believe it to be. I'm gonna start here. And then with that guess, I can take a measurement and say this should end up being three and a half. So one, two, three, and almost four. So really it could go over just a little bit more. So here's one, two, three and a half, okay? Now, if you find more exacting measurements or if you search enough, you'll find, because geometry is pretty amazing, it's, it's all over the place, and you'll find some exact measurements, but I'll try and get some bare bones down and lay it down, and then I'll tweak it and shift it as I go. So um, that's a lot of how my measuring goes. Now, I know that this piece was um, supposed to be two and a half. So again, I'm going to guess at where I want the start of that to be, and I'm going to go here, and then I'm going to measure to see if I can get it at two and a half. So there's my first measurement. There's one, there's two, and that's almost three. So I can tell myself that it can go up just a little bit higher. So I'm going to try there, and I'm going to measure again. And I'm going to say one, two, and a half, so that's good. So if you get confused, you can wipe away your you know, old mark. Um, but now I know that this line is here, and I know that this line is here. So all I have to do, that was an old mark, is connect the dots. And I see that it kind of goes, I can trace it with my finger because the body has a memory, right? And so I go over, down, right, to the line. So I'm gonna go over, and then down to the line, okay? Over and down, and you can draw it as many times as you need to. You can, we wanna talk about a lot of times not making it so manicured, like having it be more organic. And you can do that by kind of squiggling the brush out so it doesn't have such a straight linear effect to it. And then I've gone down to meet that line. And then I'm gonna do the same thing. 
I'm going to come down. I can start with a with a guesstimation mark and let it go over, down, over. So over, down, over. And I know where it's got to end. And then I can just kind of bridge my gap here. This could go out a little bit more. And then this goes down. And then I've got that shape. And this is just the bare bones. We're going to have time to go back and um, readdress it and adjust it if needed. We're just capturing what we had up here. So next, I want to move in for the rock structure again. So I can tell um, on where it's coming off. I said that it was a third across. So again, I can put what I believe to be a third here and then measure it. So there's one, two, three. That wasn't quite a third. So I'm going to come in just a little bit more, and measure again. One, two, and that was a little bit over shooting it. So I'm gonna go right in the middle. There's my third. So that means that this is where that first rock structure should end. So again, I can go from the top. It's greater than halfway. I do know that, that the distance between here, the horizon line, and here, the top, is a little bit greater than halfway. So I'm gonna go a little bit greater than halfway here. There's halfway, there's a little bit greater. And then I'm just going to go over and down, over and down. And I'm going to make it a little more regular as I go. Initially, I tend to make it really angular, and then I kind of get the organic space back in. Then I'm remembering from my drawing that the other one picked up where this one left off. And it goes over and up. And it's not quite as tall as the other one, so I'm not going to go as high as I did here. If I were to draw a straight line across here, this one would be slightly higher as it is in the picture. Then I'm coming in with some of the dark value. I'm going to create the trees. Now, whether you want to go ahead and create the shape of those trees is on you. I'm not going to at this point. I'm going to wait until I come in with the dark. So I'm just going to draw one solid line over. I'm going to go down a little bit, whereas, which is where I see this. I'm going to go over, and then I'm going to go up and around to make kind of like a cone shape for that tree. Now the tree bottom is almost right there on the horizon line, so I know that I can have that come right on that horizon line like that. For me, a lot of times it's easier to go straight, you know, across and then come back and put the bumps in because if I start trying to mimic it, um, I get more confident with that as I go. But if I try to do all that in the beginning, um, I'll get so lost on trying to get that right and perfect that I won't even pay attention to where I'm going. And I'll be mimicking the top and then I'll end up way over here and I'll be like, oh, wait, I went too long with that. So totally up to you on whatever your comfort level is. So we think about this like reducing fractions. We had taken it to the largest portions and then we're just taking, um, we took large portions that were unmanageable and made them a little bit more bite size. And now we're just looking at like, what's my largest piece? What's the largest piece that I have left? Well, I have this, which is pretty large. And then I also have the sky, which is pretty large. So how could I reduce this to a smaller form? Well, I have this one strip of the uh, deadened grass, the little faded uh, reddish, ochre grass that's in the background there. So I could drop just below my horizon line and I could put this little um, slim piece of, I'm gonna make like a little rectangle. Just enough to create, you know, a little patch there that's below the horizon line. And then I'm noticing it almost like curves around, right? The green stops right there. And then I could do another line that goes straight over. All the way to this seated structure, which again, the seated structure in the beginning of this mountain seemed to be, if I was to draw a straight line down, they're almost over. The seated structure is just a little bit further over. So if I were gonna indicate, I could say, well, that looks like the first seated structure. Then if I was to draw a line straight up from this structure, it falls to the left of the halfway mark of that. So if this is the halfway mark, I want to go to the left of the halfway mark. 
and I'm going to put that second seated structure. And then there's something dark over here. I don't know what it is, but I'm just going to put some dark value to help silhouette the painting in. I see that railing or whatever that is. Maybe it's the corner of a bridge, the side of a bridge. I'm going to go with that. Okay, but essentially I've got the bones of the painting down now, and then the green comes off from the bottom of here and connects. So within that, I've got enough divided lines that when I go to smack in some value, I will put the little triangle here that goes down to the tree. So this is a slight curve into the tree, and then this goes up. And that'll remind me where to put the blue when I go to do that. So just this much I've got, which is just kind of my drawing. At this point in your painting, um, this is where I'm always going back to double check and measure. Now, if you're a tight measurer, you may not have to. Maybe you slowed down and took more exacting measurements the first time and you don't need to. Um, if you're not and you smacked it down, this is the point to kind of reassess and say, you know, are any of my measurements off? And if so, um, how important is that to the painting, the success of the painting? Um, and it depends on what your goals are and it depends on what you are, um, what your you know, outcome is gonna be if you want it to be more impressionistic or whatnot. So some things I notice, which I can correct when I go in with darkness is, I made this line come a little bit too far up. I'd like to slim it down when I come in and I'd like to start the angle a little bit quicker. I feel like I delayed. Because it's oil, I could always just take the brush with just thinner on it and I can go in the direction that I wanna push the line. So for here, it will stain the panel, but I can tighten that in just by pushing this way. And then I can clean my brush and try and scrub some of that residue off so that I can remind myself where I'm going. But I've narrowed the gap here a little bit and then when I go to accentuate it with my dark value, I'll be able to put it back in. Okay, so with the block in, I'm gonna um, set the little brush down and I'm gonna go for the larger brush. I wanna put my value in, but I wanna go dark to light. I do not know if the um, painting is correct still. I will know once I get it masked in, I'll have a better sense of it. So I'm not really at this point trying to match colors. Remember, it's shape, value, and color. So I'm still trying to stay in the um, idea of just getting a sense of the values and the block in down. And so I do want to try and attempt warm and cool with the colors, but I'm not fixating over color at all. So I'm going to start by what I feel like the largest mass is this brownish color. And I'm going to pull a little bit of the ochre. Uh, notice that I dip my brush in the thinner and then tap it on the paper towel before. And then I'm pulling that over so that I still have a really runny amount of the ochre. And I'm pulling a little bit of the crimson in with it. The crimson seems to be pretty powerful, so I'm pulling my ochre off to the side so that I can dull it down a little bit. I'm not adding any white. The color's gonna be a little bit more intense than it is in the picture, and that's okay with me. But I'm staining this panel with this warm color by just going across, turning my brush sideways to get in that little gap, and filling in everywhere where I see it to be kind of a warmer brown. Now you can always stain or tone your canvas first, which means we could have just gone across the entire thing with a color and then we could almost treat it subtractively and pull that out. But for the purpose of doing this, I'm choosing not to. I'm gonna put just a little bit here on the edge just because the edge of it's warm. And then for sure, this little uh, rectangle that I put in here, I'm gonna put some warmth on that. I'd already done it ochre, but I'm gonna add some of that crimson to it. And then I see a little bit up here, even though it's a little more pale, but I'm gonna go ahead and put that in there. And then, I see the top part of this, there's a dark part, but I see the top part as being a little bit warmer. It's got some cool to it, but we're gonna address that in a second. So I'm just smacking some warm values down. And just that quick, I've got kind of a mass of some warm. 
Now I'm going to clean my brush. Now I'm going to come in with just a little bit of the blue, the ultramarine. And again, I'm making it real uh, watery. I know that it's going to be deeper than I want it to be. I am going to pull a little bit of this orange in to neutralize it down. I don't want it to be like fresh out of the tea blue, but I still want it to be dominant blue. And I'm going to come in and place it in the sky up here. Now we had a choice. I told you when we laid out the palette that I really thought the thalo was brighter and we had a, a crux between you know, I probably would have picked Thalo as a more intense color, but we'd have, would have had to dull all of it down. And I thought that it would be easier for everybody, you know, the levels, um, just to go with the ultramarine. The color may not be as bright in the long run. We'll soften it with some white, um, but it was easier than using Thalo and having to dull it down for everything. Now I'm also going to take my dull ultramarine and I'm going to go ahead and acknowledge the inside of the creek. And again, I'm just trying to block in to get a sense of it. And for me, honestly, I see that coolness that we talked about here. I see a little bit kind of casting off the tree. So I'm gonna put a little bit here on the top of the tree. I see a little bit here on the base of this mountain or rock structure. And then I see a little bit glazed into the top. So I did this last because that way, if it pulls some of the red from the um, existing shapes, I don't have to contaminate that in my other shapes. Okay, now I'm going to mix some of the green. So I'm taking some of this pure ultramarine down here and I'm going to add a thin glaze of this brighter uh, cad yellow or whatever yellow you have. This is for me, it's actually Hansa yellow opaque. And I'm pulling just a little bit of blue so that I get this kind of lime green color. And again, I'm going to start down here in the corner. Mix up a little bit more. And then again, I'm going to put it up here. And I'm going to go a little thicker with it. Now, it becomes a comparison of values. If I had to ask myself, which one's darker, this corner or this top? The corner for sure is. So I can add a little bit more blue to it. It's also got red in it. But like I said, we're not worried about color yet. We're just going for a value. And I wanted this to be a little more subdued. So that's what I'm going for at this time. Then I'm going to clean out my brush. And I'm going to go in for some dark. Now, whether you're mixing a Pangris gray or whether you mix your own dark, if you were to mix your own dark, we could take a little bit of the ultramarine, a little bit of the crimson, and a little bit of the ochre, so just your dark primaries. And I want it to be dominant with the blue because that's the darkest color. And if you need to pick a smaller brush, you can do that as well. You always pick a tool for the job. I just tend to use the corner of the large brush all the time. And I'm going to try and put some of that dark in there. So you see, I can get something pretty close to a black without using the black, but I did put the paint gray down just in case I needed to do that. This has a little bit of a ochre, or not an ochre, a crimson look to it, so it's coming off a little purple, but it's okay. I'm just going to put that dark in, and then I'm going to start to lay in the dark here as well. And then I'm going to feather it in this tree a little bit. Reminding myself that the tree came all the way down to the horizon line. And then the tops of these trees are a little red. That's why I'm not going all the way up to fill in that black space or that uh, blank space, the white that's left. But I am going to come down here and acknowledge 
um, any of the dark space right on the edge of the creek bed. I mixed um, all the dark primaries, so ultramarine, ochre, and uh, crimson. And you could just use dark if you put it on your palette. I was just trying to show you just as an extra thing, like, hey, here's how you can just mix it. So if you have it on the palette, you can just take it out. But I used, um, if you had to do proportion-wise, I would say it was maybe 70% ultramarine, maybe... Uh, 20% 20, 20 of the crimson and then 10% of the ochre. If you use too much ochre, it'll start turning more brown than black. So you have to keep the dominant proportion of the darker color, otherwise it'll start getting too warm. Because you know, you're thinking about it, these are three primary colors, two of them are warm and one of them's cool. So if you get heavy on these, then it's gonna get heavy on warmth and it's gonna be more brown. But if you can offset it with more cool, then it's gonna come out more of a black or purple in this case. Hopefully that helped. And I'm gonna take the side of the brush and I'm gonna put the darkness in for these seating structures. And then I'm gonna just kind of haze in some darkness on the side over here, just for this bridge or whatever this is. And I see that for me, I'm curious if I need to remeasure here and see my orientation is more compact so what I'm noticing at this point is the width and the height of this five by seven uh, is not gonna equate to the width and the height of this, meaning that if I'm measuring from the side here, um, it's not gonna be exact, but I've definitely foreshortened my seating area here. So I'm gonna see how far off the side it would come. I'm gonna move my panel temporarily. And I'm gonna measure again to see where does this come? And I see here's a measurement. So I'm gonna try and turn that measurement and see, okay, it's the same width up that it is over. So this is like a perfect L, um, but I'm gonna find out where else did I see that measurement? Where else could I, okay? So look, the combination of the bottom of the creek here to the top of the green is the same as the width of this. So I, that's not to say that this is correct, but if I'm gonna leave most of that the same, then it's gonna be the same. So I'm going from the top of my green here to the bottom of my blue here, and that roughly should be the length of my seating area here. And I also acknowledge that it came to the lower part of the uh, rock formation. So that tells me right there that I can drag this part in. This almost goes to connect with this space. So I'm gonna pull it over. Let that go into the darkness. I'm gonna set this brush aside and grab my smaller one. And then I'm gonna do just like I told you in the last one. I'm gonna move it in this direction to wipe up what I need to wipe up. And I'm going in the direction. Normally I would spin the panel, but I'm trying to keep the orientation good for the camera. But I would spin the panel so that I can easily go in that direction. And then I can just mop up what I need to. And if I made this seating area um, longer, then I'm gonna have to make this one a little bit longer to let it override into the side there. And so I basically stretched the orientation just a little bit to help it to match. Okay. So now I'm gonna pull just a little bit of warmth and mix it with the black. So I will get more of that brown color, I hope. And I'm gonna fill in this little gap here at the top, making it more warm. And I'm just gonna check to see if there's any more. Really, I could skirt a little bit down here, just above the, I'm just seeing it, especially as we get over here. I can tone some of this in. This is just more of a brown, it's still that same 
uh, dark color, but it's just more heavy on the brown side. I'm just kind of glazing over that just to indicate how dark this is, but it's warmer. And I'm scanning the picture to see where else do I see it? I see some little marks here so I can start to put the darkness in there, but it's not a heavy um, amount of paint. I see the darkness leading up to this tree, which is the bottom part of this, so I can kind of glaze a second layer in there. And I find that most people, when they're painting, they get real attached to this level. They start doing some really amazing detail and getting some really great effects, but there's not enough substance body or paint on the um, substrate. And so that's why I don't want to get really, um, you know, attached to what's happening. I just want to be able to make additional corrections. I see that this slopes in a little bit further than I think I allowed it to go. So I'm going to kind of correct that as I move up this way, meaning that this probably could get covered with white later, but I'm kind of bringing it back a little bit. And then that kind of addresses some of the seating area problem that I had before, but I didn't notice it until now. Okay. Now I'm not using white at all until it's time to paint the highlights. So the white of the clouds is just going to stay white. What I can do is take some of this residue from the blue and I can at least stain some of the top just so that it's like a little tint. I see some blue over here or if I wanted to just kind of create some color just to help the block in process, I could stain everything very lightly with the blue and just kind of tickle over these edges a little bit but literally it's just a little dirty residue just to kind of help stain the canvas and, and not leave any white showing. So it's just real subtle. And at that point I've got, you know, everything on the panel is addressed or touched. And I did leave out the people. All right, so now I'm gonna go and work my way in from the um, back to the front. I would double check any measurements at this point to see if there was anything else that was off or needed to be addressed. I think there's some minor things for me, but I think they can also be acknowledged um, a little bit later, so I'm not concerned with that. And I've got my block in, I did my gesture, I did my measure, um, I did my block in, and now I'm gonna do my shadows. But I'm also doing two things simultaneously. I'm going through to increase my dark and to put a little bit more uh, body or substance into it. But I'm also working back to front, meaning that I'm starting all the way in the back with the sky and then working my way back to the front. So when I'm looking at the planes, I've got kind of a foreground, which is this part where the figures are standing. There's the midground, which is the trees and the mountains, and there's the background, which is the sky and the clouds. So in the sky and the clouds, the values are pretty much there for me. Like there, there's nothing that needs to happen. Now it does need another coat of paint, but there's nothing um, that needs to happen value-wise that isn't there already. So I'm um, dropping the big brush because Nothing's uh, dark here requires a large amount. So I'm going to my small number two brush. And when I get to this mid ground, now I've got some addressing um, of some of the darker spaces that I wanna try and uh, consider. So I'm gonna take a little bit of the ultramarine and mix up some of my uh, dark color again. Or if you wanna shortcut it, just take your you know, dark, your black, or your Payne's gray, whatever, whatever you put down on your palette. And I'm gonna create some dark, and I'm just gonna scan to see, do I have all my dark um, shapes in place? It's not the end all be all, but I am trying to put some more dark in Anchorage to get another coat down. So the closer I get to the horizon line, the heavier a coat I'm gonna put down. And then when I get to this tree, I'm noticing that the majority of the dark is on the left side. And so I'm just kind of using the corner of my brush and I'm just tap, 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 tapping in that tree. And then I'm scanning here. And I like the solidarity that I got uh, from the base of this rock structure. 
but I do feel like it could have been uh, increased a little bit more um, as it moves up the side of the structure. So I'm gonna just kind of poke a dot. I'm seeing some dark structures uh, sprinkled in here. And I'm just gonna kind of use the corner of my brush and the side of my brush to tap those little spots in. And then after I scan that, I'm gonna look at the next layer, which is this area right below it. I see some little tickles of dark that are underneath here. So I'm gonna acknowledge those. I see like a little scan of dark here. I'm just gonna put a little area there. I see that this seating structure or whatever this thing is, is a little bit bigger. So I'm gonna just pull down slightly to make it a little bit bigger. And probably the same here, even if I'm taking the people out, it's just gonna come down just a little bit. Then I'm gonna scan my riverbed here. I'm just gonna be quick about it and take this black. And I wanna deepen any of this a little bit more. And now I'm making it a little bit more um, organic and not quite as straight. I'm really looking for the tufts and the bumps. Seeing that in relation so I can keep up with where I'm at. See it coming down and then up. Okay, then I'm gonna just look in my um, creek here and I see like the bottom of this rock, which is dark. And I'm looking at where it falls in relation. So if I was to draw a straight line from the end of that seating structure, I see the rocks to the left of it. So at least that gives me some kind of measurement where I'm gonna come down from the seating structure and I'm gonna go to the left of it. And I'll just put like a little dark shape for the bottom of that one and a dark shape for the bottom of the one next to it. And I'm scanning to see if there's any other darkness. There is, but it's more on the uh, blue part. There's gonna be some scumbling of some dark in, but as far as super dark, that's it. I do notice that this needs to be cut off for me a little bit more, but I'm not gonna do it with black. So I see as I'm looking around and I feel like out of all the darks, that's pretty good. There's a little piece up here that's part of this rock, so I can add that in. And then I'm gonna clean my brush off. Okay, so at this point, I'm gonna take a pause. I'm gonna stop the recording and I want to look at yours. Okay, so I'm gonna take some of this off by the subtractive method. I'm gonna dip my brush in a little bit of thinner and I noticed that the distance between here and here was a little bit great. So I'm just gonna kind of scrub down to remove some of that. And the point is, even if I can still see it, that I want the base layer to be so thin that I can add some of the white back on and easily uh, cover it. I'm also gonna choose to take a little bit of the darkness and just kind of cover some more of this with a stain because I'm seeing that as being more dark. So I'm wanting to, um, you know, accentuate that. And then as I move through the rest of the painting, I'll be able to uh, pull out the rest. So what I'm gonna do now is I've got the dark in. I'm gonna start with the back and I'm gonna start finalizing my back. So I'm dipping the brush in some thinner to just get it moist. I'm using my big number six uh, brush. And uh, for the, I'm gonna start by pulling a little bit of ultramarine and I'm going to put it up here in the corner. And I'm going to pull 
a little bit of that and a little bit of white out. So I'm finally pulling the white because I'm working in the background there. Now I'm going to pull a small touch of the red, just enough to neutralize the blue. I'm trying to get something soft like this is like a cerulean or if we were using phthalo it would be brighter. Ultramarine tends to give like a, a grayed out sky color. So I'm going to increase the in proportion of white to try and brighten it up. But I added that little touch of red to also kind of tone it down. And I think that's probably as close as I can get without phthalo. And I'm going to fill in this triangular section with a good bit of paint. So this is the beginning of slapping the paint on Deb in the background at least. So that I'm really trying to get a good um, coat because I do not want to revisit the sky again at this point. There's no more measuring to do. There's the colors are as good as I'm going to get with the palette that I've got. So I'm trying to put down a nice generous coating, um, knowing that I can still feather the, the clouds on top. So really I'm just trying to get the blue centered with a good coverage. Now hog hair brushes tend to pull paint off of the substrate a little bit. It's also harder to get more of a feathered look when you're dealing with hog hair brushes, which are the more coarse brushes. Um, so that's something to consider too. I'm wiping off the excess. I'm going to wipe it off on this paper towel. And I'm not going to clean the brush other than wiping it off. I'm going to go right back into the white because I want to start with a dirty white. And I'm going to um, come over here where it was more blue anyway. And I'm just going to start feathering in some of this dirty white that's stained with blue and moving my way over. And I'm going to contour the top of the mountain a little bit more. And some of those miss marks or the shaping, I noticed that it's got some ups and downs. So I'm kind of creating that so it's not just a curve. I'm going to chase it all the way to the corner where it's blue and fill in my gap. Okay, so it's still dirty. There's not a, it's not white yet. I've just tried to fill in to make sure that there's a good solid layer. And you can take a closer look at it. And then I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. I'm going to pick up a little bit more white. and pull over. My brush is getting a little dry, so I'm going to take a little bit more thinner. And it's concealing any of that ochre that I started with that's still exposed. My brain's telling me it's more blue than it needs to be, but that's okay. Now I'm cleaning out my brush. And <clears throat> now I'm going to go in for some straight up white. And I'm going to go back to try and embellish and create some of the puffiness of the clouds. And I might be able to better achieve that with a small brush, but I'm just going to use the corner of this brush. And I'm just going to tap away from the blue because the minute I pick up more blue, the um, the paint's all going to turn light blue again. So I want to keep some of this fresh white so that I can create the tuft, tufting of the clouds, make them look a little bit more billowy. And I'm tapping, tap, 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 to create that 
fainted look and I'm just kind of barely working my way into this setting. And I might tap some little sky pieces onto the blue the way it is in the picture. And the only reason that I'm putting white here now and not, you know, any where it's still early in the rest of the painting is because, like I said, there's not a lot to this background and I don't want to revisit it again. So there's nothing else to layer on the background. So we're finalizing that so we can basically close it out. I don't want to look at it anymore or address it. And you see how I'm skipping spaces. So there's some of this blue still showing through. It's giving the clouds some depth. I'm going to do the same thing on this side just to kind of break it up a little bit. And even if my rock structure is still not quite the shape I want, I've got one more pass on it where I'm going to blend it into this. So I'm not been out of shape about it. But I do notice as I'm doing this, there's some other stuff I'd want to address with it. Okay, and I could really get stuck in the steps. I'm going to move on. Cleaning out my brush. And for this next mountain part, I'm going to go ahead and switch to my smaller brush. And I'm going to try and create a color that's uh, similar to this rock formation in the background. And so I know for sure it's reading the most as ochre for me. So I'll pull some ochre off to the side. Make sure that I got these in view. And then I'm going to neutralize the ochre with its complement, which is, I hope you just said purple. I'm sure you did. And so I'm going to mix a little bit of red and a little bit of blue. I still want it ochre dominant. So I'm going to add a little bit more back in there and then I'm adding some white because it's chalky. We're dealing with the atmospheric perspective here in the background and so we want to create more of that look and so we'll purposely chalk down the paint so that it looks more atmospheric. And this is a little darker so first off I'm going to abandon ship and wipe the brush off. I do like where it's going but in order for me to get it there I'm going to have to get some more light. So I'm pulling even more white And I've got this rich kind of butter pecan tan. And I'm going to come in and I'm going to neutralize or soften some of this intense orange that was down from the first batch. Now, could we have just gone in and put a more neutral color down to begin with? Yeah, we could. But I didn't want to introduce the white that early because if I did, I would surely get a lot of um, muddy colors. So it was better for me to leave it off and have it look a little garish than to in incorporate it early and not be able to do anything about it. So once I soften some of this, I'm starting to see some of the things that I do not like about the composition and shape. And I can make alterations to that now that I've subdued it. And the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to clean out my brush really well. And I'm going to come back to that light blue color. And I'm going to cut back into some of this mountain structure that I feel like needs to be gone with sky. You may or may not need to make amendments, so it may not be an issue. But I just want to show you how you can continue to pull it out. And it makes the rock structure look a little bit more... Um, again, organic. So it's not like one big curve or 
one straight edge. You know, it's got a little bit of jagged to it. And I also acknowledge things like uh, this dark tree that I put in could go a little bit further up to touch. So again, I can use the corner of my brush and just tap, 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 tap. And I can kind of create a tree out of that that's a little bit bigger. And if you need to know that master technique again, it's called tap, 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 tap. <laughs> All right, now I'm going to increase the value on the rock structure for those little uh, portions that are dark. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to create something more on the purple side. So it's the same three colors. I'm taking some blue, a little bit of crimson, and a touch of ochre to neutralize it. So it should be more on the purple side, but it should be a dull purple with the ochre in, in place. And I'm gonna wipe my brush so that it's a flat. I don't want a lot of paint off of it. So I just want it to be, you know, um, a nice clean edge. And I'm just gonna take the side of the class or the side of the brush and I'm gonna just tip it on the side. And that may be a little bit too dark. So I'm gonna pull just a little bit of white in to haze it out a little bit still. And I'm gonna go over it. I don't want the value to be a competition with the trees beneath it. And this is, so I'm pulling a little bit more white. And I'm gonna go at it again. It's a little cooler. So I'm cleaning my brush and I'm gonna pick up a little bit of red and a little bit of ochre because I wanna make it warmer. It's supposed to be a purple color. If I need to, I can take the brush and wipe off that so I'm not continuing to mix into it. And then I'll just pull some more of this color down. And that's a better color. It's a little big of a strip, but it's the better color for sure. I'm going to mix some more so I can have more paint because I'm not getting the coverage that I want. Same mixture. Okay, so the mixture for that, per it's the same thing for the mountain and the dark parts in the mountain. It's the three colors, ochre, crimson, and um, ultramarine. When I did the mountain, it was heavier with the warm colors. And now that I'm doing the slope, it should be more of a purple. So if you can see when I'm mixing, which I don't think you can over here, it's like turning into a, um, it's not purple <laughs> for sure. So I'm gonna pull some more of the red and the blue over to try and make it more on the purple side. And then I'm pulling some white in to lighten it up a little bit. So when I add the white, it should have kind of a purple look to it. Now, if it looks like too purple, then you may have added too much um, color and you could kind of soften it out by adding the white. I'm gonna pull some more down from here. I'm going to put some more on the other side here. Now my section's got really big because of the brush that I'm using. It's a hog hair brush. It's not like a, you know, synthetic brush, which would make it more polished or finishing. So with this little size, five by seven and that little detail, it's hard to get this brush. You see how puffed out it is? And that's hog hair brushes. They can resist the turp, which is great, uh, but they also get like fried hair, like they start to get kind of split ends um, and they start to take a beating after a little while. 
So I'm going to mop up just a little bit of this just to kind of tone down the value because it was such a small piece. So you can see I was able to feather it out a little bit. I'm going to do the same thing down here. And then this is why we work dark to light. I'm going to take some of the light caramel color that I still had mixed up and I'm going to go back in on top with that slope to pull it back out. Okay, so by the time I'm done, you know, it's a little bit better and lighter, you see. So now I'm going to move to either side of this tree. I see some dark green on this side. And then I see this garish um, lizard and crimson that's the top of these trees that I need to address a little bit. So I'm going to start on this side. It's a green. So I'm pulling my ultramarine with a little bit of my bright yellow. And I'm going to see if I can <clears throat> let that be dark enough to at least fill in this space. And that's okay. It's a little bold. So I'm going to have to add some of the complement, which is a little red to it. And that was way too much red. <laughs> so I have to pull the other colors to balance it out. And then I'm just dusting the top of some of these other trees with the same green so that it won't be black necessarily, but it's got just, just where I see the green, there's a dark green that's there that's apparent. And I'm cleaning out my brush. I'll give y'all just a second to catch up to that. Now I'm going to turn this a little bit more warm, this area that I have. You may not have that, but I've got this little ochre area that is a little bit light. So I'm going to pull a warm color, getting this. I'm trying to get ochre, crimson, and a little bit of blue. And I'm just filling in that to get rid of that bright. And I'm just using the corner of my brush to make it irregular so that it'll look like 
the warm of the top of some of those trees that I see. Then I'm scanning the rock formation. This is a little warmer here, so I'm just going to put some of the warmth also there. I don't want to lose that value, but I can come back and, and put it in with some uh, white in just a minute. And then while I've got this, you know, ochre color right here mixed, I'm seeing it down here as well. So I'm just going to go across the bottom of this, adding a little bit more to help anchor. And I'm cleaning out my brush. And for me to straighten this out, I'm going to take the brush with just some thinner and I'm just going to wipe across to thin it out to make it a, a, a little bit more flat, but also I, I couldn't paint a line that thin, but I can certainly subtract it back out. Okay, so now in order for me to complete the midground, I need to get rid of that uh, bright orange that's in the back right here. So it looks very similar to the mountain color up here, the rock formation, and it's just a little bit darker. I happen to have some of that still here left on the palette. So I'm just going to pull from that stash and I'm going to overlap on top of the darkness a little bit. Just my goal in my head is just to dull down that orange. My mind's telling me that the paint layer is still too thin. My mind is telling me that it's too dark because it's mixing with the dark. I'm hearing all that, but my goal is just to tone down the orange. Now I'm looking at some of the lighter parts of this mountain over here, and I can use that same color to bring some of that back out. And you're like, well, you just painted it darker. Why, why didn't you just leave it? Because it would have been a, a thin layer. It would have been the bare board showing, and it would make it look a little bit more effective to paint in those highlights than to leave it the way it was. And get just a little bit more white. Again, I want it to be a dirty white. I don't want it to be too light. And at this point, I'm going to scan my midground to see is there anything else that I'm unhappy with. There's two things. One is that there's some purple, atmospheric purple that is back here on this rock formation. So I see it as being a hazy purple. And then also there's some sky holes in this tree. I see some that come and dig up this way. And then I see some other speckled in there. And I want to address that. So I'm going to take some of the purple color. This is the same purple that was just blue, uh, the ultramarine blue, the crimson, and a touch of the ochre to neutralize it. And it had the atmospheric white in it, just meaning that it was a faded purple. I still have some here, so I'm just going to use that. And I'm just going to touch these little background spots.
and this is having more of an appearance of red than blue. So I'm going to add a little bit more blue to it and a little bit more white to it. Okay, then I'm going to take some of the white and the light blue, and I've got a little gap here. You may not, but I've got a little raw board that's showing, so I'm going to nip that in the bud. But then I'm also going to take a little bit and dig back into the tree so I can create that irregular piece. You know, it makes the tree not look like a giant. Um, gumdrop gives it a little bit more and then I'm taking the corner of the brush and just tapping some sky holes meaning that there's some light shining through that tree and it's kind of minutia but I'm going to show you a close up I'm going to take some dark I'll just take some of this dark green. I'm using the corner of my brush and I'm tapping little irregular patterns here just to show, you know, some variety of the growth in the background. So again, it's not just like a sloped angle. So just barely tapping some of that. And I'm pulling like a dark green, black. And I'm going to do that here with this tree too. The darker I make it, the more it lets the tree stand out from the background. But I don't want it to be solid black, you know, it's got some green to it for sure. And I want that to show. So it gives me a little bit more variety. And I'm going to do the same thing here so that this isn't so sloped. And there's a couple of bushes or plants in the mid-ground here. I'm just going to mix up some ochre and green. You can add them in or leave them out. But I added a small touch of white to it to get it to be like a hazy olive because it's still kind of a background feature. And I'm going to put that tree in. I see that the two of them are in front of this dark tree. So that's where I'm going to place them, just to kind of break this up a little bit as well. I see one over here to the side on a fence. And then I'm going to put a little bit of light over here, where I'm acknowledging that there's so much dark going on. And I'm just tapping it around the edge of that tree just to really make that tree stand out a little bit more and to accentuate some of the light in the mid ground just at the top. 
Just tap in with the corner of my brush. So that hopefully I'm telling myself, okay, I got background done, I got mid-ground done. And I can always revisit it. So don't feel like it's the end all be all. It's not like just because, you know, the clouds are done, you can't go back up and address some. It's just overall it's kind of harder. I'm putting a little trunk on that tree because I forgot to anchor it down. And I'm gonna add a little bit of black to the bottom of these shrubs too to anchor them. How are we doing so far? That was a lot of little detail instructions all at once. And because everybody's are at different developments, you may not have to do some of the things that I'm having to go back and do. So I'm going to mix a green now to go right here in the mid-ground. And so I, I had a green before, and it's not that it was bad. It's just that I'm going to need to um, get a little bit more of it so it has some more body. So I'm taking some ultramarine, and I'm going to take some of this uh, cad yellow light. And i got to make sure that it's real dominant with the cad yellow light. I might even stick a little bit of white in there just to help it show up a little bit more. So I'm even abandoning that pile and getting even brighter. Get this ultramarine out of here. So it's really bright. And I'm taking the number six brush and I'm just going across and filling in that green. And my main objective is to not leave any of the board exposed. And because I have the color out, even though it's not time for the foreground, I'm just going to go ahead and spread it down here also. So without cleaning my brush, I'm just going to go in and pull a little bit more ochre and a small bit of red. And I'm gonna feather the top up here. Just to neutralize that one section. It should be thick so that I'm not seeing board, but I see it's kind of reddish back there. And also around the corner here, it starts to get a little bit more deadened. And it's a pretty bold green. So I mean, even if I pull a little bit, I'm taking a really watery amount of um, ochre and uh, crimson in together and I'm just coming back and toning this down a little bit so it's still bright but the red and the ochre are letting it neutralize down a little and I like that color better just having a little bit of that red in there with it because it was just the cad yellow and ultramarine
and now I'm lifting it back up unintentionally. Now I'm taking a little bit of ochre, a little bit of crimson, and that's too much crimson, so I'm coming off to the side. And I'm gonna pull a little bit more white. And I'm trying to make a really dull, deadened color for that grass. I'm gonna pull a little bit of ochre and a small bit of blue to cool it down. So I'm getting this really dulled out color. And I'm going to come in and fill the remainder of this. It's a pretty good match. And I'm just letting it overlap slightly on the dark that I had put on earlier. And then I'm going to do the same here. Now, if you had to acknowledge a color differentiation, in addition to value between the creek, you probably notice that there's a little bit of purple in it. It's like our casting that red glow. So when I go to fill it in, I'm gonna add a little bit of blue, the ultramarine. I'm gonna add a little bit of crimson, but I still want it to be predominantly ultramarine. And then I'm gonna add a little bit of my black or if you were mixing a black, you can uh, leave that. But I want it to be, you know, kind of dark at first. And I'm gonna come in and fill in my colors. I don't wanna lose my rocks, but the rocks are almost the same color as the darkest part of this. This layer is a little bit thinner. I can mix up some more paint. And go in a little bit th thicker application. And I'm just feathering it in to create that darkness. I had said earlier that this embankment was off a little bit for me, so I'm going to go ahead and taper it down as it should have been the first time. I'm leaving that spot blank so I can remember to put the rocks there. And then as it moves over this way, it's a little bit lighter. I'm gonna go ahead and lay this dark layer down.
Okay, I'm just gonna wipe off my brush. Not clean it, just wipe it off. And I'm gonna pull just a little bit of white. And I'm coming in from the side to make it a little bit chalky in appearance, which is showing that sheen on the water. And again, you can use a smaller brush for this if you want. But I'm just trying to put where the light is reflecting or beginning to reflect on the creek. I'm gonna skip some space. Cleaning out my brush. I'm going to skip over to the smaller brush now. And I'm pulling some more white to begin to acknowledge where I see some of this, um, where the water's hitting up against the rocks and I want it to be a little lighter. And let me get some more white. I'm noticing that my rocks are here, so I'm gonna to come to the right of them and put just a little bit more of the where the water's hitting the rocks. I'm noticing a little bit more warmth or red as I'm doing that, so I'm gonna just kind of tap this white in some crimson. I don't wanna make the water look bloody, but it does look a little warmer to me in the areas. And I'm kind of blending some areas, but I'm leaving some of that darkness in so that I have those ripples. So that you can kind of see the flow of the water materializing. This middle part in between the rocks, I don't really see as much white, but I do see some of the red. So I'm gonna try and put some color variation just so it doesn't look flat, but I'm not really seeing it as much red. And then I'm going to actually paint these three rocks that I see in here. And I've already got some mountain tan mixed. So I'm just going to start with that. And I'm going to put the top of a rock here and here, knowing that I can adjust this color in a minute. And then I see one. It's not here, but above it here. I'm going to lighten the value of it just a little bit and lighten certain values of this.
And then I can clean the brush and come back to finesse some of the grass now that I've got it in there. I'll mix the same color again, which was um, crimson, ochre, and white, but I'm gonna get real heavy with the white. So I've already got the pile mixed here. I'm just adding some white to it. This was just crimson, white, and ochre, and I'm adding more white to it. And then I'll take this number two brush and I'll just like give it a little bit of a machine gun tap. And I'm just kind of letting it blend in with the already wet paint. Mostly just staying where I see the highlights. I see, and if it looks a little too white, I can blend some yellow in just to keep it not so chalky. And again, I'm just using the corner of the brush. Tap, 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 tap. And in the same sense, I need to get some dark tapped in there too. So I'm pulling my purple color back out. And I'm gonna mix that up here with the ochre. Um, this is the ochre um, alizarin and white mixture. And I'm just mixing a little purple in there. And I'm just noticing from the seating, I'm gonna come off with just a dark value color and tap that in there too. I see it coming off of this seat. I see some down here. It's really dark. Cleaning my brush out, and I'm going to go for something a little warmer. Just, and it just becomes this marling of colors until you can, you know, get it more on the green side, more on the red side, you know, but putting these ultimate other base coats down so that you're not showing raw panel anymore. And of course, the places where I chose to omit the people, I have to kind of make up, you know, what I want to be there. And that color is too bold. That's where I have to be careful because I don't want anything to be straight out of the tube. I want everything to be subtle. Otherwise, I'm just kind of, you know, screaming at the viewer. I'm 
put a little bit more green down here. So I'm just mixing some green in and splatching it. Taking some dark green down here and tickling it in where I see it. And some of this reddish grass color back in here too. Okay, so this could use a little bit more finessing with the brush. Um, take a rest from it, but at least the fill-in is complete and the colors are complete. 